Now the key here is each of these procedures has been performed, but you can still see where the puzzle comes together. The last part of the puzzle is the quality of the intervention. And again, repeating what Professor Booza said, the number one risk factor for the patient is who they choose as their dentist. Because dentists are not all of the same. The average dentist is not the same as the dentist that's highly educated and highly experienced. So what you see on a podium from clinicians and experts is not always reproducible. So these numbers and these lines in the sand and the recommendations that are made, they rely upon the clinician having the capability to be able to do the work. So if you want it to look like this, and we go back to the start, where there are no lines, where the intervention has been made and yet it's not visible to those that observe, you need to do things the right way. Now I wouldn't do everything the same way anymore. This patient was treated in the early 2000s or late 1990s, somewhere between 1998 and 2001. To be honest, I can't remember. What I remember is we took out the third molars, harvested bone from the retromolar region, and placed it in the anterior maxilla. Would I do that today? No, I wouldn't. We would use a different grafting material. Certainly wouldn't get as close to the neighboring teeth as we did back then. We'd use different methods, but we'd perform the same procedure. We need to augment the residual ridge to allow an implant to be positioned so that it will support a tooth in the long term. That means we need a volume of bone after everything is done healing to remain around the implant. Years ago, it was always considered to be one millimeter. I would think it's safe to say today we'd prefer more than one millimeter.